now it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker today, Carolyn Kelly. Carolyn is a physical therapist at Children's Hospital Colorado. Her specialty is pediatric neuromuscular disorders, including CMT, DMD, and SMA. She works in the neuromuscular clinics at Children's Hospital Colorado and is a clinical evaluator for neuromuscular trials, including therapy trials for SMA and Duchenne. She's part of the Children's Hospital Colorado SMA newborn screening program and foot management teams. Her professional interest is early identification of children with neuromuscular conditions, early mobility, and getting children and their families participating in community programming and adaptive recreation. She's a volunteer with Adaptive Recreation for Childhood Health, which is a program that helps kids with physical disabilities participate in sports and adaptive recreation. So we are so excited to have Carolyn here today, and I'm going to stop sharing and turn the time over to Carolyn. Should I be seeing my PowerPoint? <laughs> yes, you'll want to hit share there. Okay. Thanks everyone for your patience. Welcome. Thank you to the MDA for having me. Uh, we good? We are good. Awesome. Um, so welcome everyone. Thank you to everyone for coming and especially to our translators. Um, to offer this program in Spanish. Um, I think that's really great. Um, I have more of a casual presentation style. I want to make sure that I'm addressing your needs and answering your questions. So feel free to put your questions in the chat ongoing and Marissa is gonna help me to answer those during the presentation. We don't have to wait till the end because I know sometimes um, people have to leave or go and they have pressing questions, so feel free to put those in. Uh, if it gets too heavy with the questions, we'll, we may revisit that, but for now, let's let's do that. Okay, so, um, oops. So I have no disclosures related to this topic. Um, I don't um, specifically endorse any of the products that I will talk about today. They are meant to be a sampling of what is available out in the community. Um, my objectives for today's talk is to give an overview of the adaptive equipment and technology used by people with Duchenne, um, in addition to some other adaptive equipment that typically is not recommended for Duchenne and why. Um, considerations for choosing equipment and technology using a when and why framework. Um, discuss ways to maximize independence, participation, safety, and fun, and to give an overview of um, some funding. So these are my partners. This is my team at Children's um, in Colorado. Not everyone is here. Some of these pictures are old, um, but I could not do this work without all of them. And I would like to partner with you today. And so I would like to know who is on this call. Um, so Marissa, if we can open the poll. So Carolyn, I think you actually now have control of the poll. If you go up okay. to the top of your screen, a uh, drop down mm -hmm. should come. And Oops. there should be um, the three little dots, and it'll okay. say polling. polling. Oh, I do have that. Okay, so can you, if, can everyone who's on the line see this? So um, if you could just answer the question, if you're a person living with DMD, a caregiver, a loved one, um, a pharma or biotech representative, healthcare professional, or other. And then I'm going to open the poll. Um, and it's not, can people answer? Oh, here we go. I think people are starting to answer. Okay. Maybe. This is all very exciting and interactive. Um, other. Okay. Hmm. Other, other, other. Caregiver. Okay, I'll close the poll here in just a second if you want to answer. Okay, so we have kind of a mix of, of people. Okay, I'm going to close the poll 
Um, and then let's see, what do I do with that? Um, loophole. Oh. Um, okay, so my next question, thank you for those who answered. Um, uh, it actually did all of the questions in one, I think, Carol. Oh, I didn't scroll down. Okay, so it maybe. Looked, um, looked like you had a fair amount of caregivers, um, okay. a lot of different age ranges, um, and people looking to learn about what new equipment or, or equipment that they already have equipment but are looking for some new stuff. Great. So my talk kind of overviews a lot of these things. If there are topics that we want to get more in depth on, we can just put um, your questions in the poll. Um, okay, so adaptive equipment defined, and this is defined by the, the American with Disabilities Act, is any item, piece of equipment, or product system that is used to increase, maintain, or improve functional capabilities of individuals with disabilities. Um, so this can go anywhere from a high-tech power wheelchair to adaptive utensils. And the idea here is accessi accessibility is, should be the default. So we all know that Duchenne is kind of a cruddy, is a cruddy di diagnosis, um, but I was inspired by this article in pediatrics that came out in 2018 um, that had language that I want to think about and utilize um, as a jumping off point for my talk today. So st things that I read in this article, steadily improving management, improved physical and functional status, increasingly successful transitions, self-actualization, more successful management, changing natural history, more consistent comprehensive care, disease-modifying treatments, advances and expansion in care, um, assistive technology with increased emphasis on participation, self-advocacy, independence, um, and ind individuals um, experiencing life transitions with the achievement of goals and fulfillment. And so with all those things in mind, how can we use adaptive technology and equipment to support all of those positive goals um, of a person living with Duchenne? So as, as you are probably familiar with, Duchenne is um, widely written about and is broken down into different stages of the disease process. Um, starting with ambulatory, which is sometimes further broken down into early ambulatory and late ambulatory, early non-ambulatory where people walk, um, but perhaps not for long distances, and then late non-ambulatory for when people are primarily seated. Again, I think the natural history in other neuromuscular diseases has clearly changed. We hope, we're hoping for the same thing in Duchenne, but for the purposes of today's talk, we're going to consider adaptive equipment and and what they, they talk about in the literature is doing that at every stage of the disease process. And Duchenne has written about um, standards of care, which are outlined here in, three, in a three-part series. Um, and for the purposes of today's talk, we're gonna talk about different buckets of um, equipment and how they fall under each of these different categories. Um, so I think it's important to think about equipment from a framework because things are always evolving and new things are coming out. And so to me, when I think about equipment, I think about when, uh, when in the disease process and or when in a person's life are you considering the equipment and why? Um, so the when is, we can acknowledge this is a hard transition when a person goes from walking to not walking and things get more difficult slowly, sometimes more quickly in some people, but safety really becomes an issue. And so ideally for all of this equipment, we're considering things early because if you've um, been in this space for a while, you know things take a long time to get ordered. Sometimes funding can be a challenge and then delivery. Um, and why do we consider adaptive equipment? So I work with an amazing therapist, Terry Carey, and she calls um, mobility equipment or adaptive equipment, the great equalizer. It helps with energy conservation, makes life easier, and allows participation. So we're going to start with mobility. 
And overall, when you are considering a mobility device for yourself or your child, um, you're looking at things like where where are you at? And this typically, we get a lot of information from going to your um, clinic assessments where people, physical therapists are doing time testing and doing outcome measures. Um, but also you see things at home. Are, is the person falling more? Are they having muscle cramping, fatigue, um, not keeping up with their peers or their family? Are they needing more breaks? Are they self-limiting for longer distance mobility? Like they're just not interested in doing long walks at the zoo, at the zoo anymore or not going out as much. So how to choose. So when you're looking for a piece of mobility equipment, what do you need it for? Um, and again, these are gonna be very individualized answers and things to consider. Um, where will you use it? How will you get it there? What are the consequences if you don't get it? How will you transport it? Who will pay for it? And who can help you in obtaining it? So using the when and why um, mentality, let's first look at when to consider adaptive equipment in this early ambulatory stage and why would you do that? People are still walking, um, you're not, you may not be seeing many signs of the disease, but occasionally a, chi a child typically at this age, um, when a long distance mobility demand exceeds their endurance or speed requirements. So I think of a family that I worked with where the child had Duchenne and their older brother played soccer. And mom said, we're always running late and the soccer fields always seem to be the on the furthest end of the park. And getting getting to the so getting to the sibling soccer game on time was a problem. And so they were considering a mobility device because they were late and they had really long distances to go. And so in this stage of the disease, we wanna think about lightweight manual mobility devices. And again, these are general um, guidelines and from my professional experience working seven years in the neuromuscular space, this isn't going to be right for everyone, but I do, um, I do wanna give some general guidelines. So in the low tech options, uh, we have adaptive strollers, manual wheelchairs and transport chairs. The adaptive strollers are lightweight, easy to get in and out. Um, they're often not covered by insurance and they don't offer a lot of positioning. Although at this stage of the, at this stage of Duchenne, you don't really need many positionings. I think a lot of times you can forego the adaptive stroller and just use a regular stroller. The manual wheelchair at this stage is a little bit of a better option because it can be used for other things. So um, it's lightweight, um, it, you can self propel it, and it can also be a backup mobility device for power mobility somewhere in the future. Um, I think it's important to note that depending on what state you live in, um, insurance companies sometimes will only pay for either a manual wheelchair or a power wheelchair. So for instance, in the state of Colorado, they'll pay for a power wheelchair and a backup manual wheelchair. But in Wyoming, the state right uh, where we see a lot of kids from Wyoming, they will only pay for one or another, one or the other. So if you're going through insurance, it's important to know what um, your state covers. And finally, a transport chair, and this is lightweight and often people pay for these out of pocket. Again, no ability to self-propel, no growth, and little postural control, but sometimes families like this option if they have to go, um, most often I see if they're traveling through the airport quite a bit. So if they're going on clinical trials and need to do a bunch of traveling, this can be a good consideration. Okay. So as we move down the continuum of the functional stages, it, when once we move into the late ambulatory phase of the disease, we think, okay, why do we need a mobility device now? Um, and this is intermittently needed for energy conservation. If walking is becoming difficult, if people are falling more, if walking is slow and you can't keep up with your family members or peers, um, and um, or sometimes a manual wheelchair is too difficult to propel. So if those are the situations that you find yourself in, then a lighter weight power option may be the way to go. Um, and these come in um, two groupings, the power scooter and the folding power chair. So in our clinic, we really like the power scooters. Um, we have a couple in clinic, people can test drive them. Um, they don't offer a lot of postural supports and they are big because they don't come in different sizes, but they're easy to disassemble and transport um, and they're easy to learn how to drive. The folding power wheelchair is a different um, option. You see a little bit more expensive, 
Um, I've heard people say they don't hold charges very well, they don't adapt seating, but they're very convenient to fold up and um, transport. So let's talk about scooters, because I think scooters are a really nice bridge between going into the full power wheelchair mode and something lighter weight. Um, so scooters typically come in a variety of flavors, three versus four wheel. Four wheel is more for the off-road person. Three wheel has a tighter turning radius, so these are typically better for classrooms. Um, you can do, you can select different wheels. Um, batteries are an issue for scooters, so oftentimes, um, a person doesn't need a mobility device all the time, and so they have this should um, something change or when they get sick. Um, but batteries, if not properly charged and maintained, do um, crap out on people, so you have to be aware of the batteries. They, they typically don't come with a lot of postural supports, including a seatbelt, but that is something you could add on. And you can take it apart, <coughs> excuse me, and in this picture on the right, you see it comes apart in about five to six pieces, you take the battery off, you take the back end off, you pull the seat off the tiller and then the tiller, or sorry, the seat post, and then the tiller folds down like a taco. So you can get it in the back of most standard size cars. I will tell you, they advertise that this is really simple and easy and lightweight. Some of these pieces, especially the battery, weigh a decent amount. So just consider this, um, this is, it's not super easy, and a lot of times people will use the, leave the scooter at school um, so they don't have to transport it. But it can be transported is the, is the point. Okay, moving on. So fit matters. It matters from when you first start considering a mobility device all the way through a person's lifespan. So you see this kiddo on the top. He's very happy. He's driving his power scooter, but it looks enormous. And here on the bottom, there's been some adaptations made, so there's a much better fit. So what, are, what we're thinking about with the fit is that the arms can reach the drive controls. And so you have to be seated far enough forward that you can reach things. Now, the picture on the top left, there's a lot of dead space in between the back of the wheelchair and the person. So that can be filled and should be filled for safety. <coughs> Excuse me, arm supports, um, because there's no seatbelt, these arm supports can be a safety feature. Ideally, the hips and knees are bent to 90 degrees so that you don't have dangling feet and legs because that only encourages more of that pointed foot posture. Um, so ideally, the foot is flat on the footbed. On, but like I said, there's not different sizes. So small humans, big scooters, what are you going to do? So first, you can consider the seat height. So there is a little bit of um, adjustability on the seat post, um, but if it's not enough, which is oftentimes the case, you can physically cut it down. Um, I will caution that if you cut down a seat post, it often, depending on who you get the scooter through, will um, make any warranty void. Um, so people sometimes build up the foot plate instead and by putting a ream of, of paper covered in duct tape on the foot plate or raising up the floor, which is what this one family did. They took a piece of board and put screws in it. And as the child grew, they would take the screws and screw them further into the bottom of the board so that it could go lower. And then they secured this foot piece um, to the, the base of the scooter with a strap. <clears throat> So seat depth we talked about, the love lumbar support is something that we love in our clinic. It, you can put it in the back of the, the seat to keep, to keep up space and not make the seat so deep. Um, any pillow or cushion, you can really do that too. Or sometimes we got fancy with this kiddo and we put a Cosmo seat, which is a, a power wheelchair that they no longer make, but they took the seat off of a Cosmo and put it on the base of this power scooter. Mm. We were really excited at the beginning because it fit him really well, but I will tell you, he grew out of it really fast. And because it was so snug, it was hard to transfer in and out of. So there's pros and cons to all these um, hacks. Jennifer Wallace is a is a physical therapist who works for, um, uh, who has some really great YouTube videos about how to modify scooters, if you're interested in further information about that. <clears throat> So power assist. Um, so this is one of this is a slide of I want you to know what's out there, but this isn't typically recommended for people with Duchenne. Um, so power assist is something that you add onto a manual wheelchair to give it some power capabilities. 
Why we don't typically recommend it is because you can see the cost of them are quite high, $6,000 and $7,000, which insurance will help you cover, but then that takes away from the resources for other mobility devices. And typically, these are only used short term. So the smart drive, you clip onto the back of the wheelchair and it, it helps you drive. Um, it gives you like a power boost. And the e-motion wheel, same deal, except it's built into the wheel. So these are easy to transport and they are covered by insurance, but not, but they take away resources from other places. And weakness, um, as we see with a lot of people at Duchenne, can make stopping these sorts of devices difficult and um, they can make them more tippy. So power assist, good to know not highly recommended. Um, this power, these power assist features are considered recreational wheelchair attachments. So I think they're super cool. They're made by Real Mobility. On the top, it's a Firefly electric scooter attachment and you clip it to the front of the manual wheelchair and it allows you to drive. It, it tips up the front casters and then you can drive with it. And the Dragonfly is a power assist hand cycle. Same deal, you attach it to your manual wheelchair and then you, you drive it with your arms, which is really great because we know exercise for the upper extremities is important. The issue for this one is because, they're, is because insurance companies categorize them as recreational, they are not typically covered by insurance. And these I would say are more for shorter term solutions or for exercise. Okay. So as we move down the continuum, early non-ambulatory phase, um, why would you consider a mobility device? Well, maybe the other mobility aids that you've been using, like your scooter or your manual wheelchair, are no longer giving you the postural supports that you need, and the concern for scoliosis and contracture progression is an issue. Um, you may be having more ish difficulty with transfers and spending more or most of the day seated. When these criteria are met, then it's time to think about something a little bit more heavy duty, and that typically comes in the form of a power wheelchair. So when you're considering a power wheelchair, you should consider where's the primary environment where you're going to use the chair. Um, have you used a chair in the past and what features of that chair are you using regularly? That helps for insurance justification on your new chair or what features are not enough because people are changing all the time, um, something that you might wanna change. So, and then you, you also should consider your unique, you, your, you, yeah, excuse me, your unique circumstances. So where do you enjoy spending time? Are you a rural person? Are you in cities? <clears throat> what are your hobbies? Are you more of an artist and going to museums? Are you out in nature hunting um, or anything in between? Um, are you a student? Are you employed? And again, these all play into what type and what features um, are you going to get on your power wheelchair? So um, Dr. Laura Case um, has a great chapter in the rehab management of the patient with Duchenne muscular dystrophy about components that are typically used on power wheelchairs and people with Duchenne. I'm not going to go over all of these, but I think it gives a nice overview. And more importantly, it gives the purpose and rationale of why you would want to use it. I think this is really important to know when you're starting to talk insurance um, funding. So there's three different types of drive that you can have on your manual wheelchair. The first one is front wheel drive where this larger driving um, wheel is in the front. Um, this is better on variable terrain. It can easily navigate tight corners in the home and you can pull up really close to counters or sinks or for young students to desks. There's the mid wheel drive option where the bigger drive wheel is in the middle of the chair. Um, this is preferred for indoor, for primary indoor use. Um, tight turning radiuses. It's got a really stable base and it's easiest to learn how to drive since the center of the person's mass is right over the drive. It's more intuitive than others. So people who are having a hard time learning how to drive sometimes will go to a mid drive option. And finally, there's the real rear wheel drive where the larger drive wheel is at the back of the chair um, with two casters in the front. And this was this was the original power wheelchair um, configuration. It's also very stable, naturally tracks straight. So if you have someone who has a hard time keeping the chair going straight and it has great performance outdoors. So again, there's different nuances for every, every um, situation. So you wanna consider your unique um, needs. Mm -hmm.
it matters. Um, so we know um, kids with Duchenne are more prone to contractures and scoliosis. So we want to be conscious of that. Um, so when your person comes out to do your measurements, they'll use um, a schematic like this on the left to do measurements. Um, but three things that I wanted to highlight specific to people with Duchenne is the trunk position. So again, because of the high risk of scoliosis, we want to give supports and people can sometimes be weak. Um, so they may need those supports more at the end of the day or intermittently if they're having a day where they're feeling more weak. However, I caution um, having too rigid of trunk supports because often as um, arms get weaker and shoulders get weaker, kids will use a side side bending motion to, to make their arm um, move upwards as, their sh as strength in their shoulder decreases. And we don't wanna lock them in in their trunk so that then they lose function in their arms. So it's a delicate balance. Um, hip position is also important. Um, kids with Duchenne tend to splay their legs open because of just their pattern of weakness. So we wanna make sure the thighs are nice and straight. And then foot position, as you all know, can be challenging as well because kids walk on their toes and they develop heel cord contractures, some, not all. Um, but we want to make sure they have good foot position on the foot plate of their power wheelchair so their feet aren't falling off. And so the progression of their contractures, um, so their contractures are supported but not encouraged to progress. Okay, and then driving. So learning how to drive. So I say practice, practice, practice. Some kids need or some people need um, power wheelchairs earlier than others. And some parents will look at me and say, there is no way my child is going to be safe to drive, drive a power wheelchair. And I would say most can learn. There's always exceptions. Um, but uh, practice is really important. So getting a loaner, using it at school, um, not all therapists are familiar with how to support a, a person to learn how to drive a power wheelchair. So this PIDA is a indoor driving assessment that has amazing ideas about things to work on, on learning how to safely drive a power wheelchair. It was developed by a bunch of OTs in Canada. Um, and it includes things, and it's not limited to, but like some examples are how do you turn the device on and off? How do you utilize the braking system? using the speed control switches, driving through doorways, parking beside a table, going up and down ramps, turning, driving backwards. And so breaking down the task of driving a wheelchair into smaller component parts and practicing each of these um, can help build success. And then still when someone is learning, um, they, they, they don't always get it right the first time. So attendant control switches can be really useful in terms of um, having some way that uh, an attendant can control the chair remotely in case um, people get into a sticky situation. Um, so talking about power positioning components for people with DMD. So we know I, from a few slides ago, there's lots of components. I wanna talk about the power components that we often recommend and I would recommend for people with DMD that I think are really important. Oftentimes they'll say, oh, these are hard to get funded. Yes, but we're going to talk through some strategies on how to do that. So um, the first one is the, the power tilt. And these are all power functions in that they can be controlled by the driver using um, the electronic switches. So they don't need somebody else to come and help them. So the power tilt is they maintain the seat back angle stays the same and the whole seat tilts backwards. Um, this is important for pressure release, relief, and um, if a person gets tired from sitting up during the day, it allows them a more relaxing position. At the time you are, you are ordering your first power wheelchair, you may not need some of these features. It is important to ask, can these be added on at a later time when your child's or when your person's um, strength changes um, or not? And so even if you're not needing them today, having a consideration for they may be needed in the future is an important um, thing to note. Um, so this is this is power tilt. Next is power recline, where the angle of the back and the seat opens up, so you're in more of a laying down position. And because when you drive a power wheelchair and you're weak and you're in there for a long period of time, your um, hips get tight and your knees get tight. So this is a nice option to give you a different um, positioning. 
Then there's power elevating leg rests where the lower portion of the leg goes up. So that's needed for um, the power for the recline, but also you, it can be used from a seating position to straighten your knees, which can um, help just change the position of your knees, help with contractures, give some variety. Um, the power seat elevator is, so the whole seat goes up, um, power seat, uh, uh, and that's also power adjustable. And this helps with functional access to the environment. So things like turning on a light switch, getting something from the cupboard, making yourself a snack. Um, for older people, it's, I, I once worked with a person who was a lawyer and he would go up to the bench and the judge couldn't see him. So he used the seat elevator to speak at eye level with the, with the judge, speaking at eye level um, with your peers. Um, and then also transfers between surfaces that are the same height are much easier than transfers from a low surface to a high surface. And finally, the standard. So the standard is, I will tell you, the most difficult thing to get um, insurance to pay for. Um, but if you can get a standing feature on your power wheelchair, it's much more convenient than having a standalone power wheelchair, uh, power standalone stander that you need to transfer into. It does add extra bulk to the wheelchair. So if the person doesn't isn't going to use it, it's not worth it. And they're not completely independent. This is the only one because you have to add these um, two additional parts at the front of the legs and the front of the body. Um, so you're not completely independent in going from a sitting to a standing position, but it does allow um, a person to stand for shorter bouts um, throughout their day instead of one big standing session, which is, is often hard to make time for and often not as well tolerated. Um, and it minimizes the risks of falls if you're transferring from a power wheelchair to a standalone stander versus it's all integrated into one unit. So I wanted to introduce the concept of RESNA, which some of you may know. It's a professional organization, the Rehab Engineering and Assistive Technology Society of North America. Um, it's the professional society of people working in assistive technology, and they um, certify all of the ATPs or assistive technology profess professionals who work for the DME companies and provide continuing education. They also put out a journal and they have an online tool for families to use to find a qualified professional to help um, procure equipment. The best thing that I like about Resna, and I use this all the time, is they publish position papers explaining the medical or functional uses of some of these power functions and why they should be funded by insurance companies. Um, or other funding sources um, based on best practice trends. So um, Resna did one um, in 2013 was the latest edition of the support of standing in power wheelchairs. And actually the Medicare um, guidelines group is now hearing open comment from families and people who are using both standing functions and seat elevators so they are not so difficult to get fun funded. So this is a general list of why standing is important. It is not specific to Duchenne, but it includes a lot of nice language in terms of getting justification. Specific to Duchenne, um, the benefits of powered standing um, was outlined in this article. And basically from standing, um, over the first 12 months of using a powered wheelchair standing device, and that was about an hour a day, um, joint angles remain the same. So contractures did not progress. They did not improve, but they did not progress, which is pretty awesome. And con continued standing was, was associated with better mental health and independence in supported standing, meaning they could do it themselves when, when at a time when ambulation was deteriorating or getting lost, assisted both physical and mental health. So literature and support of standing. I spend a little bit of time, more time on standing than some of the other functions because the other functions are more readily um, um, uh, approved. And so when you're thinking about a standard, I just want to be clear and transparent. It's not for everybody. So the, they 
there was a consensus statement that came out. So who, what, what people with Duchenne should be standing? And they found that if you could comfortably stand for 10 minutes in a power, um, in a power wheelchair standing device, that was good. If you had ankle contractures less than 10 degrees, meaning you could, you didn't have to have your foot completely flat, but it had to be, it couldn't be a big contracture. The person who was going to use it had goals that reflected motivation to use the standing function. Oftentimes we go through a lot of work to get the standing function and then the person doesn't use it. So they have to be motivated. Um, we, we had one guy, he really wanted to have a standing function because he um, just had a new girlfriend and he wanted to go to the school dance and dance with her. And so he was super motivated, not that going to a dance is a great reason to put a super expensive feature, but for him, it really gave him the motivation. Um, and then introducing the power wheelchair standing device when the motor skills are declining, um, but that they haven't been seated for a long time because this allows them to extend their independence. And then evidence that the family, the person's therapist and the servicing support were all um, going to enable the continuity of continuing to use the standard. All were the reasons why um, a person would have more success using a standard function. And then, um, and then if they did use it, we see from research, it promoted independence, health and community involvement. And they think that, that the reason for that was they had improved social skills, improved self-confidence, reduced caregiver strain and improved quality of life. And I would say, yes, this, this information um, can be used for any mobility device, but this um, specific research talks about the standard. Carolyn, I was going to interrupt real quick. It looks like there's a question yes. in the chat. It says, "Yes, um, when using the stander, the wheelchair can move. I'm not entirely sure the context of the question. but Yeah, so depending on your wheelchair base, no, mostly yes. There is some exceptions depending on the base of where the primary drive wheel is. And there is some, some um, speed, like it's slower. Um, but yes, some some models um, that can be done, but I do think that would be an important question um, to ask your um, assistive technology partner who's helping you get it ordered. But yes, it can be done. Great. And then one that came in a, a little earlier was um, what kind of things can be used for scoliosis? So for scoliosis, they want... Um, so 90% of people with Duchenne get, go on to develop scoliosis. So not that we're going to completely eliminate the risk of scoliosis, but if you have lateral supports on the side of your wheelchair, where if you're feeling weak and you're going over to the side and you can maintain a more midline position with the postural supports of the wheelchair, you're keeping your body straighter, if that makes sense. Does that answer your question, whoever had the scoliosis one? That's a good question. Um, Those are all the questions for now. Sorry. Okay. Great. Thanks. Um, so moving on to the late ambulatory phase of Duchenne, why are you going to consider a mobility device? So you may be selecting a different mobility device or different components on a mobility device because your other mobility aids were not giving you enough postural support. Like in the scoliosis ex example, you may have gone on to develop um, scoliosis, so your body is tilted to the side and you need to accommodate for that in the wheelchair. Um, your contractures may have changed and you may have be having more difficulty staying comfortable in the chair all day long. So what are some other things you can add on to your power wheelchair? So alternative drive systems are one option and you see the picture at the top and is an attendant control drive so that the person, this is on a transport chair, but you can add these to a power wheelchair. So if the person is driving and they fatigue, um, the person who's the caregiver can take over the drive um, options. There's also micro light joysticks, which is this picture on the right, which takes less strength to manipulate. And these sometimes can be put in different positions. So oftentimes you see drive controls on the side of the armrest, but sometimes a person when they bring their arm into the center of their body can drive better. So it's changing around the position of the drive controls. And then as strength continues um, or as strength changes, 
Um, there's other options of driving if if the loss if you're not able to drive a chair with your hands. So arm supports are something that can be added onto a wheelchair. Um, I will be transparent. We have not had a lot of luck with arm supports in our clinic, but we've had kids that have come from other sites that are extremely successful. And I think I, I, I think the problem that we have is for the arm supports to be successful, the setup has to be really good and it has to be modified ongoing. So you have to have a therapist or a professional who can make small tweaks and changes. So as the as the function that the person wants to do and the strength changes, you can align those things. Um, so and trials are important. So, for instance, we have had a couple of kids who are super into the idea of arm supports and then they we order them and then they come and they're like, it's enormous. I hate that thing on my chair. I can't even get through a doorway. Again, that's not everyone, but trials are important for a lot of this assistive technology to see how it feels and works for the particular individual. So the neater arm is the picture on the top. This works as a sling on the forearm. And then this red circle is a lift. And so you press a button and that that device turns and lifts the upper arm, which then causes the slope, um, which then causes the hand to come towards the mouth. Um, the, the Rex arm support is a series of bungee cords. So you see here on this lower picture, the blue are a series of bands um, that can be um, oriented differently and with different amounts of tension so that the person can use their arm um, in functional tasks, but also the Rex is really nice for exercising the arms in a weak person. Abilitech, Abilitech makes more of a robotic feature. So this, um, this device connects to your arm. Um, it's custom calibrated to your unique needs. Again, Duchenne is a changing progressive um, or any, it's a changing disease. So the custom calibration is not gonna be forever. It's gonna be for a period of time. But this device uses springs, motor, software, and it, it makes, um, it optimizes the use of your arm, but doesn't do everything, which is really nice because, again, you can still use what you have. So research in mobile arm supports um, was based on a case study of four people, um, and three out of the four people when using the mobile arm supports did have success and feel that it enhanced their upper limb function, their arm use and independence with ADL. So things like eating and brushing their teeth. Um, eating and drinking were the most positively impacted activities that were helped by the mobile arm support. Um, but like I've said previously, you really need a good setup and ongoing clinician expertise and intervention to really get it right. Um, some barriers, if, um, if they're really weak in their arms, these devices aren't the greatest. Sometimes the, the connection of the mobile arm support to the wheelchair can um, interfere with the wheelchair controls and then often they're hard to get funded. Um, but if, if I impress one thing upon you today, um, a lot of things are hard to get funded, but that, that we should still try <laughs> if that's something you've trialed and it is successful. Um, so it should be considered um, as the disease progresses and strength declines after a successful trial and with someone to um, monitor the fit and um, the use of it. So let's briefly talk about funding. So MDA has a really great, um, I'm not sure if it's happened or it's coming up about how to do this process. So this is gonna be just a very quick and dirty overview. Um, it so you make a decision that you're going to order some equipment and so then you need a prescription from either a doctor or a nurse practitioner and that can come from either your neuromuscular clinic or from your primary care provider um, but you also need physical therapy notes you have to be hooked up with a physical therapist that will justify the need for equipment but also have an assessment of your strength and range of motion which is needed for the paperwork um, you select a DME company, which is Durable Medical Equipment, New Motion, um, National City and Mobility. Those are some of the larger ones. Um, there's also smaller, more regional ones that sometimes can offer um, 
better customer service, not always. So the DME company and your the, the people that you are ordering equipment through ideally go, um, um, ideally is close to you because these things need fixing if they break down, um, delivery. And if you don't have access to a DME company close to where you live, if you can pair it with close to where you go for your neuromuscular care, that can also be helpful. So you select a so you've, you're going to order equipment. You select a company. You've met with a physical therapist, and then you're assigned an ATP, who is the person who's going to help you with the ordering. Um, again ideally geographically close to where you live, and ideally someone with some experience with Duchenne. So they could know that even though you don't need ele power elevating leg rest today, that might be something that you would need in the future and would be nice if that was a consideration when you're ordering your chair. The assistive technology partner comes to either your house or you go to their office and they show you the options that are available. You talk to them about what components you think you would need and then they take your measurements. After that, the company will submit an itemized list of all the components to your physical therapist. And when I'm saying itemized list, I'm talking like hardware. So you need a headrest. And some of the things you think, yeah, who doesn't have a headrest on a power wheelchair? No, every single thing needs to be justified, which is why I, I've been talking a lot about why you want these certain features because they all have to be justified, including often the hardware that is used to attach the component to the chair and not just the fancy components, even like the basics. Um, so that letter is written. Um, templates are um, developed by a lot of the neuromuscular care centers. To de so we use language that we know the insurance companies want to hear. Um, and then that letter is signed by both the therapist and the provider. And the provider might be a, re a physiatrist, it might be one of your neuromuscular muscular clinicians, your primary care. Um, and then all of that paperwork is submitted to insurance for approval. Um, oftentimes people have both private insurance and secondary Medicare. Um, in Colorado, um, at the Children's Hospital, they submit all the paperwork to both of these um, places at the same time because they know private insurance typically doesn't cover the whole cost. And so then Medicare will sometimes pick up what the primary insurance does not cover. And then after that, you wait and wait and you either get an approval or denial or you could get a partial approval, meaning, OK, we'll give you a power wheelchair, but we're not going to give you a standard standard feature on it. And so my my learnings from the last years of doing this is don't take no for an answer. It's very common to get a denial. Don't be bummed. It's just part of the process. Again, this is why it takes so long. So pens is when you get um, you the whole thing is not approved as you wanted it. So you can appeal that, meaning, okay, they said you could have everything except the seat elevator. So then you go back to your therapist and they write even in more detail about why the seat elevator is necessary. Sometimes you have a change in function between the time you initially started the order till the appeal. So I could say, oh, they are now able to transfer themselves um, on same level surfaces, but can't do stand pivots anymore. So the appeals, that's writing letters to try to um, provide further justification of why a component part should be funded. Um, and you can also make the decision, like I've had plenty of kids who've gone for a stander, they didn't, they were denied the stander and the parents said, you know what, we were kind of on the fence about the stander anyway, forget the stander, we just want to get the, the wheelchair ordered. And then there's a process also that comes after appeals um, called the peer-to-peer -peer call. And that's when, an, when one of your treating providers, your nurse practitioner or your physician calls the insurance company and talks on the phone with another provider as to further justification. If you can skip to the peer-to-peer, -peer, those are typically very successful. The letter writing takes a long time and the going back and forth can be arduous. So then hopefully everything gets approved and then you get the delivery and final fitting and then the modifications and repairs on a power wheelchair, just like on any piece of electronics, um, is an ongoing thing. And as people are growing taller, wider, 
um, their function is changing, they may need more components. Um, these are these are things that happen. I think one of my my favorite moments as a therapist was going into a, a clinic room and asking, okay, how's all your equipment? I asked the boy, how's how's all your equipment fitting? Oh, good, my my leg rest broke. And I said, oh, okay, what happened? And he said, oh, I was I was with my buddies and who are also in power wheelchairs, and we were at a mountain bike um, park, and we were going off jumps. Um, that were typically <laughs> made for mountain bikers, but in our power wheelchairs, and I busted up my um, leg rest. So not that I'm endorsing going off jumps on your power wheelchair, but I thought that's awesome that they were doing that. And that stuff happens all the time. Um, so state to state coverage varies. Know what your state covers, like we talked about earlier. Some states cover a power and a backup manual. Some places cover one or the other. So you just have to be thoughtful about the when and the why and the, the timing of things. Um, typically, um, new equipment can be purchased between three every three to five years, or if the cost to repair or grow the equipment um, uh, exceeds what it would be to just replace it. Um, if all of that fails going through insurance, there's used equipment locations and loaner closets. Um, you could do trials. So we had a family that moved and they were the child was diagnosed late and he was close to losing walking. And we knew he needed a power wheelchair, but he really needed to practice driving his power wheelchair. So his mom went to, and he lived in a state where they were gonna cover one or the other. And so mom went to a, a, a place that had loaner equipment, got him a manual wheelchair while he continued to trial um, and learn how to drive his power chair safely. And then of course there's alternative funding resources, crowdfunding, GoFundMe, churches, um, schools. Um, so there are ways. Um, so here's here's my here are my boys, the ones that go off the power wheelchair jumps. But what I love about this picture is everyone on the left hand side is in a power wheelchair and they all hang out together. Some of them are brothers, some of them are not, but it's a big group of of kids and the dad said to me if you can have if you can get your kids with other ki kids who need mobility equipment it's just it's it's awesome and down here is a track chair which in colorado is really popular because we have lots of trails um but we'll talk about that in a little bit okay so standards i'm gonna kind of breeze through this so standalone standards we've already talked about not the best um it's it's safety for weight bearing and before contractures are not um, too severe. And there's prone standards where the support is in the front. There's supine standards, which the support is in the back. And there's sit to stand standards that go from a seated position to a standing position and allow for some contractures. Again, none of these are awesome for Duchenne because of the transfers to get into them and people aren't going to stay in them for a long period of time. So I want you to know they exist, not a highly recommend. Bath equipment. So you can you can consider bath equipment at any stage. Typically, late ambulatory, early non-ambulatory is when we start talking about bath equipment, or when people are having more falls in the bathroom and they want to be independent and they don't want their mom to help them shower. Then bath equipment is a consideration. So bath equipment comes in many forms: raised toilet seats, handheld urinals, tub transfer benches, shower chairs and tub lifts. Um, and if we have more time at the end and people have specific questions, we can come back. Um, so bathroom configurations are a really important consideration. Do you have a tub versus a walk-in shower? Um, early mods for bathing before you have, have to, you know, at the more late ambulatory, early non-ambulatory, a handheld shower nozzle um, that's pictured here on the right, grab bars for safety, um, and nonstick mats can be really useful. Early mods for toileting. Um, this is a device um, that you, you put the toilet paper in this, this is on the far left. You put the toilet paper in this blue knob and it allows you to wipe after, after going to the bathroom without having to reach your hand all the way um, behind. Bathrooms that are in rental units versus people who own their home, there's often a lot of rules around what you can and cannot install permanently versus temporarily in rental units. Um, what are kids gonna use at school? Often kids will toilet in the nurse's office. 
or at least have somebody outside the door when they go to the bathroom should there be a fall. Um, Two-parent households, insurance typically don't cover um, bathroom or equipment for two households, so you have to decide what is the most important and where are you going to keep it, and then also what you would use for travel. Lift, lift systems is early, um, more on the late non-ambulatory phase, unless you have a larger person and a smaller caregiver. Um, when there's a higher risk of falls and fracture, um, we've had a lot of kids who use crawling for mobility around their house, and then they're big and they just have a really hard time getting off the floor. Um, so then lifts would be a consideration. On the top here is the hydraulic or electric lift. Hydraulic means as you pump it, electric as you press the button. This is more of the Hoyer, probably one of the most commonly used in Duchenne, um, and it slides under a surface. The sit to stand standard is typically like the, the sit to stand standard that I talked about previously. People use these, they have wheels. Um, they sound good, but they have limited use because once weakness progresses, it's hard to stand and hard to use them. And then on the bottom is the overhead lift, which is a lift that runs through the tr through a track system on your ceiling. This is what's typically used in hospitals and a a um, a, um, a sling is connected to the piece that's from the ceiling that goes under the person and helps transfer. Oftentimes people will use these in their bedrooms to go from their wheelchair to the bed or in their bathrooms. Um, Voyager was a big company that made these. They were um, they were having a tough time during COVID, but um, overhead lifts are an option as well. So a hack for a lift for travel, the perfect lift. We are loving this in our clinic. It is less than one pound, folds up small, and you can throw it in a suitcase, and it allows you to lift if you're traveling. The one downside of it is you need at least two people, one on each side with these straps to help transfer, but it can be used. People are using it on airplanes. People are using it at the beach. It can hold up to 300 pounds, um, can be used in case of emergency, but the perfect lift is something to check out if you travel. Other sorts of lifts, stair lifts are things if you have stairs, so you sit and it brings you up and down. In Colorado, these aren't typically covered by insurance. Elevators can be installed in someone's home. There's wheelchair van lifts where you drive onto the platform and it lifts your wheelchair up into the car. And then other vehicle options are this platform that hook onto a hitch in the back of a car. It's good for early transport, but not great if you have bad weather. Uh, and we had one family who had the didn't have this installed properly and they, the first time they used it, the wheelchair flew off and it was totaled. So if you're gonna use any of these external um, lifts for your power wheelchair, just be sure they're installed correctly. Um, transporting of power chair, there's vans that you can drive in side at entry versus rear entry. Um, MDA also had an ad adaptive driving course, um, which I think is really, um, nice and should be considered. Typically, there's a fitness to drive test. So can the person drive? They can be either transferred to a chair or they sit in their wheelchair while they drive. Um, Drivable is a great resource to find um, professionals in your area who do the adaptive driving test. I will tell you they are typically expensive and aren't covered by insurance. Although depending on your state, vocational rehab depending on your age and your career aspirations, it sometimes do cover them. Like Oklahoma is amazing vocational rehab um, and covers things like this. Um, the accessible vans are expensive. They're $20,000 and up. So just know um, sometimes using alternative ways to find vehicles like Craigslist or from another family is definitely worth uh, consideration. Beds. Um, so open bed frames, meaning there's space underneath, like on this top picture for a Hoyer lift to fit underneath, or here we have an example of um, a table. These are typically seen in hospitals, but can be great for kids that, or for people that have to spend more time in their bed. Um, sliding sheets, lightweight bedding, wedges and pillows. How often do you need to change your position overnight? If it starts getting up there and you're just not comfortable sleeping, 
um, then it's time to consider a hospital bed. There's the two options are fully electric and semi electric. Fully electric is that with a push of a button, you can adjust the head, the feet, and the height. Semi electric is you can adjust um, the head and the feet with the electric hand control, but you need a manual crank to do the height. Again, some of these can be difficult to um, get approved. In Colorado, they just flat out say we are not going to. Um, fund fully electric beds, but with the proper uh, documentation, semi-electric beds do get funded. And then there's different mattresses. Um, um, Marissa, do you want to quick check in with the questions? Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> so one of the questions that came in is, my son's Permobile F3 Corpus battery is getting discharged. The battery barely lasts for a couple hours. Um, she's unable, she or he is unable to get replacement for the battery in India. Um, so is there any form of, uh, for assessment for a wheelchair as um, her child needs a customized chair post spinal reconstruction surgery for scoliosis? So that's a really great question. Batteries, because of the supply chain issue, are really hard to get. So oftentimes the DME company, and I'm not sure how it works in India, um, will give you a loaner battery because it becomes a safety risk if your battery goes out. I typically say always keep, if you're going for a new chair, keep the old chair as a backup because you can use things, sometimes use things like the parts, like a battery, or if something happens to yours, you can go into the old one, um, at least temporarily while you're waiting for your replacement. Um, but batteries are a super hard, challenging thing right now, and I don't have a great solution, except that we are telling families right now, battery maintenance, um, battery maintenance from the beginning where you are charging it on a regular schedule and keeping it in good tabs. And then a lot of times people have to bring chargers to school or work because their batteries are going out while they're waiting for a replacement, which takes long. Um, another question, it says, also my son does not like the side laterals on the wheelchair and refuses to use them. Uh, he tends to incline incline towards one side. Is there anything that can be done for stability and proper sitting? Yeah, so that he's not the only one. A lot of people say that. Um, so if that is the case, I typically don't argue that, but then I try to make sure that they are changing their position more frequently throughout the day so that if he's going over to one side, if he can use his power tilt or recline to bring his body more into the midline and do that more often during the day. The, the recommendation is every hour. I don't know anybody who does it that frequently, but that's one option. The other option is to put add more supports where the hips are. So oftentimes if the hips aren't in a good position and the legs aren't fully supported, it makes the trunk going over to the side more more prevalent. So making sure his butt is all the way back in the chair, the seat belt is secure, and then his legs are in a good position because it's like building Lego. So if you have a stable base, everything above it can be better. Um, and then the final, um, the final thing is sometimes there's contoured seat backs. So it's not the lateral, but it's more of just like a, a rounded seat. So that might be enough to give him the support he needs without having to do a straight linear lateral. Great, thank you. Um, looks like there is a, a comment, maybe a question in here. It says, I'm 57 years old with DMD and I use a lot of adaptive equipment. As the equipment being used gets older and worn out and needing replacement, I'm finding more often than not the expression from vendors they do not make that anymore. This can be a challenge yeah, yeah, yeah. for individuals with DMD that become used to um, um, used to and depend upon the equipment. This is something totally. that should be considered and addressed in regard to obtaining and using equipment. I, I totally agree with you. And I think the Voyager lift was like the perfect example of all these families had these Voyager lifts, the overhead lifts in their house. And then they said, oh, we just stopped making that. 
I think that sometimes if you go to a different DME company, so for instance, we had one family that had a Voyager lift, loved it. They moved, so they just needed to install it. And the company where they uh, where they got the equipment wouldn't install it in their new house. But they got a new DME company, and they would. So if you're running in, not that everything is going to still be um, in production, but if you are running into someone who just says, oh, sorry, they don't make that anymore, to me, that's someone who's not willing to work with you and that possibly look into a different DME company and um, and see if they can offer at least an alternative. Um, these are really good questions. I I was gonna maybe just skip ahead because so so there's other um, so there's other so there's mattresses for the beds and there's different kinds. There's other home modifications, voice control, Alexa, like. Just as we get used to doing things a certain way, there's also some real benefits to some new technology, like the call my buddy through Alexa. So if your child's home alone or your person's home alone and they fall and they need help, you can say, Alexa, call my buddy, and you can program it that they're gonna call someone. Um, the the light bulbs, the the just all the Wi-Fi technology can be super great. Um, and if you're still running into problems with positioning or equipment and you just can't figure it out, oftentimes bioengineering labs through large universities, like we have one in Colorado called the Center for Inclusive Design and Engineering. Most places, most large university has something similar to this where you've got engineers, students, clinicians, and consumers and entrepreneurs trying to figure it out. Like, okay, you have this problem. Like we had this one kid who could not get comfortable in bed and he was waking up every hour and his mom was came in and she was so tired and he was comfortable in his wheelchair and he got all the x-rays and everything was fine. But when he went into his bed, he just could not get comfortable. He went to this place, they figured out this, um, this, perfect configuration of wedges and pillows, nothing too high tech, but it's just fit him perfect and had the time to really spend with him. And now he's sleeping and places like this are super invaluable. Um, I just wanna spend like the last few minutes and then I'll take further questions to talk about like equipment is can be hard and it can, Duchenne can make things a lot harder, but I think that they're so, if we think about technology and how we can utilize it to have fun, I think that's really important. Um, here's my guys. They went on. They a big group of them went on a um, on a um, cruise together. This is a pretty simple, but I think a great starting point about traveling and things to think about when you're traveling. This upper picture is a is a chair that they use. So you bring your you drive your power wheelchair or your mobility device down to the end of the if you're going to travel by air, down to the end of the um, where you where you load onto an airplane, and then they put you in something like this to bring you to your seat. If you can't sit up, this easy on vest is a great thing to help give additional support in your trunk if you're going on a long airplane ride and you just don't have the strength to keep your body up. Um, TSA, if you give them notice, um, will give you an escort through security to help you um, get through an air, get through an airport. Um, and then adaptive recreation, as you heard at the beginning, I believe strongly in this. I feel like it's fun. It's just figuring out ways to do fun stuff. So pools and swimming are super great. Um, there's a lift to get in and out of a pool. The picture to the right is an accessible ramp pool. So you take a wheelchair, like like what is pictured with the PVC pipe and you go down the ramp. So then you can get a person with weakness in and out of the pool. Um, there's all terrain wheelchairs. A lot of places will rent these. Um, so beach wheelchairs, which have the big wheels so they can go on sand. Um, um, unlike a, like a traditional, and, and they're made of materials that can't rust. Um, and then the track chair is something that can take, um, you can take on trails. Again, this is all, a lot of places will rent this equipment. You don't have to have your own. Um, adaptive skiing, so I live in Colorado, so I'm a big fan of this. So you have the picture on the left is um, 
um, using the ski poles with um, like little skis on the bottom so people could keep balance. Their sit skis and then sit um, ski bikes. The Tetra ski is super awesome for people with Duchenne. They have it in Utah. They have it in Colorado. They're trying to make it um, more available to other places. But if you go on vacation, on a ski vacation, this is a driving power wheelchair ski. Um, the person who is behind just has a safety rope, but it's 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 operated by a joystick, somewhat like a power wheelchair. Um, adaptive climbing, this is utilizing different equipment and a different harness system so that this boy who had um, leg weakness um, could climb. Adaptive archery, so this, um, the taller person, uh, the picture on the left is adaptive archery, so his arms weren't strong enough to hold up the bow, so he had a vest, and then the bow sticks into the vest, and then he uses his mouth to help pull back the um, the string. Sorry, I don't, I'm not an archer, I don't know the proper name. Um, adaptive fencing, um, this is another um, joystick controlled adaptive um, feature. Um, on a kayak. Um, adaptive gaming, I know a lot of the boys I know are really into video games. At some point, it may be difficult to operate a traditional um, gaming control. So I love this organization. They have specific examples for muscular dystrophy and how to be successful at gaming. Um, so adaptive equipment can be used in a variety of settings. Um, mobility day to day, but also in fun. So I'll take any other questions if you have them. Thank you so much, Carolyn. Um, this has been so informative and, and great. Uh, it does look like there's um, some more questions. Um, how to know if my child can drive a vehicle? He's 15 and I'm more nervous on thinking about it, but I want to give him the opportunity to do it. Totally. So I would go, um, so one, it's okay <laughs> to be nervous. That's just how it is. So I would think about what his arm function is. I would talk with his clinic if he has a physical or occupational therapist about what they think in terms of his strengths. Um, and then if they think he could physically, if there's a consideration, I'm just going back. If you go on to this drivable.com, they will give you a list in your area of um, certified driving specialists who will actually give you the test to see if he is safe to drive and then make recommendations of how that would look. Do you have any advice for using braces for po proper posture? Yeah, so we, in our clinic, we do the the bracing overnight when kids are still walking. And once they go into the wheelchair, um, we will use bracing sometimes. And that should be a consideration when you're getting your wheelchair fit. If you're planning to use um, a brace in your wheelchair so that the, the height of things is proper. Um, some some people think that's really important and and we talk with the families a lot about where is the utility in doing bracing once you're seated some families feel like that's really important and some don't so i think it's an ongoing conversation with your clinic team but as it applies to this talk if you are planning to wear um, braces while you're sitting in your wheelchair you should get the wheelchair fit with those braces on um Another comment is a uh, kid eight and a half toe walking, do AFOs help? So, and I'll assume that there has been a diagnosis of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So I think it's important to know why is the child toe walking and in the situation of Duchenne, they're toe walking because they have weakness in their muscles proximally. So that is not a recommended um, it, it's recommended at night to maintain the range of motion when they're not walking, but it's not recommended um, during the day because they're, they're toe walking as a compensation. And if you take away their compensation, they're going to fall more potentially and have more strain on their muscles, which we don't want. That makes sense. Um, here's a, another question. How often should a hospital bed mattress be replaced? Uh. <laughs> 
<laughs> That's a good question. So now hospital beds, oh, these are, it's like so annoying. So you have to go to one company to buy the actual hospital bed, and then you have to go to another company to get the actual mattress. At least this is how it is in Colorado. So the mattresses that are the airflow ones, which are, um, I'll be scrolling. So they have to have 24 hour service available in case like your mattress goes flat in the middle of the night. Some, you have to be able to call somebody. So I, I think it's a really good question and I'm not really sure. I think that the obvious it's broken, then it needs to be replaced. But what is the, what is the maintenance? Like whatever is the prescribed maintenance because the the mattresses differ slightly in terms of what maintenance is required is become familiar with what that is um we had one family they had a bunch of cats and so their mattress got worn out um because of the cats were scratching on it and they were able to patch it and it was totally fine we've had other families that um I don't know, like a glass or something broke and it punctured the air system and then they had to completely replace it. So it really depends on what is your mattress and what is your situation, but I'm not entire. I, I couldn't say with certainty for there's not like one size fits all for that answer. Um, I do want to say like mattress toppers are super seem to be super um, popular amongst the kids that I work with or the people that I work with. Um, a lot of times they're saying these air alternating pressure ones, which are the ones that are kind of the, a pain to because you have to get them from a different company. They feel like they're being swallowed and that feeling of floating, which is the goal is so that you don't have to get repositioned. They report to me that they feel like they're getting sucked in. So um, a traditional, a more traditional um, hospital bed mattress, it has to be a hospital bed because the other ones don't fold. Um, but an inner spring or a foam with a mattress memory foam topper is good. And then those people say, when I travel, I, I sleep much better because I'm not used to some fancy mattress setup. So sorry, that's not like a super direct answer, but. Carolyn, thank you so much for being here. We greatly appreciate your time and your expertise.